You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. What's going on, everybody? And welcome back to Dear Culture, the podcast for, by, and about black culture, spreading blackness, sounds of blackness, optimistic type of blackness. As long as you keep your hands to the sky, Dear Culture is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Panama Jackson, and today we have a special guest, and it's a special guest because we're keeping it in-house. See, one of the good things about the Griot Black Podcast Network, of which Dear Culture is a part, is that it's hosted by some amazing, interesting people. And I feel like we need to let sure or need to make sure that everybody who's hosting gets an opportunity to, to share about their own personal stories because I'm excited to be part of this group of folks. Which brings us to today's guest, Dr. Christina Greer. Let's let's put our hand virtual hands together for Dr. Christina Greer. How are you doing? I'm great, Panama. How are you? I'm awesome. And she is the host of The Blackest Questions, a podcast of which I was on, but that that episode is now part of the archives of digital black history. But I remember feeling doing that podcast, feeling extremely slow and extremely uh, uninformed about the questions you were asking. But I learned a lot. And that seems like the whole point of the uh, of The Blackest Questions. Please tell the people about The Blackest Questions, the podcast that you host on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Well, thank you so much for having me, Panama. I mean, I love being Grio siblings with you. So I have a a quiz show podcast because I'm an academic. So, you know, I got to, you know, have a little pop quiz here and there. And so it's it's a podcast essentially because I argue that Black history is American history. Black history is world history. So I bring on really smart Black people and I ask them questions about inventors and entertainers and history uh, and it's diasporic so we're covering Africa and the Caribbean and Black America um, just so we can have a little fun and we can entertain ourselves but we can also educate uh, our listeners as well. I got wrote a book called Haiti Uncovered, Original Adventure into the Art of Haitian Cuisine and for me that book was about traveling to Haiti and exploring the food in its traditional form. And no, not everyone gets five out of five, correct? Oh, you got me, you got me. Uh, let me see, let me see, let me see. I knew you were gonna go there, Dr. Greer. But it's a way for all of us to learn about all the great black people who who have done and are doing stuff in, in our world. Yeah, look, I've listened to the episodes and you're right, it's very diasporic. You have people from all over the place uh, in different walks of life doing different amazing black things. And I listen and I'm like, listen, I poor people. I know how I felt. I felt very, very self-conscious because you it's like you missed the first question and all of a sudden the pressure's on. And I feel like that's what happened. Like I got half of the first question right, which was a shame because I think my question was like, what's the what's the name of the president of Morehouse College, which is my alma mater? And I got like I know his last name, but I did, realized I didn't know his first name. I think I named him after the guy who founded Wendy's. Mm. I think I called him Dave Thomas, but I think his name was like Harold. I don't even know now. Already I'm on on the hot seat. Uh, Listen. (laughs) So, but here's the thing, and it's not to embarrass any of our guests. And, you know, I I think people get nervous, right, and have these brain freezes. But it's also, it's helpful for me, you know, as an educator, yes, I do like putting people in the hot seat. I know uh, later on I might be in the hot seat, so I'm trying not to be nervous. But the whole point of the pot the pod is to have fun and hopefully our listeners you know i get texts and dms from different people who say like i got zero out of five i had no idea about any of these these individuals that you listed and so that's the real point so people can can learn a lot more about all the great things that black people have done and continue to do in this world born in thayer nebraska this person invented ranch dressing around 1950 who are they i have no idea so here we go. It's Steve Henson. He was just in the news not too long ago. He was originally a plumber, but he came up with a recipe when he worked in Anchorage, Alaska. And he moved to Southern California with his wife in 1954 and named his property Hidden Valley. And as the popularity grew over the years, Henson wow. sold it to Clorox, the Clorox company in 1972, for $8 million. And so he passed away in 2007. So in 2017, Hidden Valley Ranch products brought in $400 million. Absolutely. And I love it. I, I've I've definitely learned a lot of things listening to the podcast, like little little trivia bites that I can take to the next party I go to. Now, I might not have the facts right, but I know other people don't. So I can kind of fudge it and make it work for me. <laughs> it's a beginning. It's a beginning seed planted. That's what I like to think. There you go. There you go. Well, one of the interesting things about you and there's several and I, I have a I have a question. I want to get back to the blackest questions was that it's like. You're an author. You're a podcast host. You've done several podcasts. 
you're a writer in different places like you literally like who is who is dr christina greer in the big picture because so many black people live in cities that's why i like cities i like to think about how they work the history of migration of black people to cities but i'm really interested you know i wrote this book called black ethnics and it's about caribbeans africans and black americans i'm really interested in how black people build coalitions so we can get more in a policy space. That's essentially what my book is about. And so the podcast, Blackest Questions, is really just another way for me to explore Blackness. Because I am an American politics professor, I'm really interested in how we exist in this country that hasn't loved us, that, that is literally uh, formed on white supremacy and anti-Black racism. So how do we not just survive, but we have thrived in this country. Uh, and we've done it largely by working together in different ways and across time and, and space. So that's, that's what I'm constantly trying to excavate and uncover and discover. And so this podcast is just me on a little uh, journey with some interesting people who I may not cross paths with in, in the classroom. Um, and it's just other people get to ear hustle in on our conversations and learn something. Fair enough. How'd you come up with this idea for the Blackest Questions? Like, what's the impetus for this quiz show trivia Black history podcast that is so entertaining and so engaging? <laughs> well, when I was in grad school and then, uh, you know, after, even after that, I threw these parties where for Black History Month, we would have quizzes. And so people would break off into teams. You know, we'd party for a while and then it was ding, 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 it's time for the test. Uh, and so you'd break off into a team and there were identifications, there were fill in the blanks, there were, you know, chronological orders, there was matching, um, you know, the, the sort of SAT, you know, read the paragraph and identify who the speaker is. And so it turned into a, a great way for other folks to get to know people at the party. Uh, and, you know, obviously black folk can be very competitive if you've ever watched us play cards. So um, it's about speed and accuracy. Uh, and so because we had so much fun learning about uh, either obscure black facts or things that, you know, quite honestly, we should know, right? We should know that Shirley Chisholm's the first black woman to ever serve uh, in U.S. Congress. We should also know that she's the first black woman to run for the presidency on a major party ticket in 1972. So those are the types of questions where so many of us were denied this, these facts in, in school, uh, and no matter what kind of fancy schools you went to or whether you went to non-fancy schools. So it was a way to, you know, to have some fun. Obviously, I'm an academic, so you know there's going to be a quiz. Um, and then it's just transferred into uh, a version of that now in a podcast. I definitely want to get to the academic part because I'm very curious about what, you know, what kind of classes you teach and like your academic pursuits. But if I hear you right, you threw a test and called it a party? <laughs> Yep, sure did. Every year. Huh. Is an annual test, like an annual bragging rights yes. uh, so test, basically? whatever team won, you know, they, the, they'd get books. One year we gave out rings. Um, but you had an entire year of bragging rights. So I threw a lot of parties. Uh, and, you know, up until COVID, I, I threw a lot of parties. Um, and so you basically at the at every subsequent party until the next black history month you got to brag and say that you were part of the winning team and then you tried to hold on to you know your title but the composition of the teams was always changing you know one year a whole bunch of journalists won one year a whole bunch of historians won one year a whole bunch of hodgepodge folks who just didn't really have uh, a professor background they beat the whole the whole party so you know it's it's a lot of it's a great way to also just mix it up and, and make sure all of my friends meet one another in a high pressure situation while they're taking an exam <laughs> gotta ask was there ever a team of non-black people that won do non-black people attend the blackest the, the, the black question test party yeah so there were there are lots of non-black people who were on teams with black people but you know they actually did really well because they studied they did not want to walk into a room full of black PhDs and other really smart black people and embarrass themselves. So they were the ones, you know, because you can't use your phone, you can't, you know, use the internet to help you answer the questions. So they were the ones who studied, I mean, studied, studied, not just about black American history, but diasporic. They knew the presidents of various African nations and Caribbean nations and when they got their independence, you know, they wanted to study inventors. They wanted to study athletes who broke barriers. I mean, they were not about to come in and embarrass themselves because if you are a non-black person and you're rolling with me and my friends, you're coming correct. 
Like it's it's there's no <laughs> there's no half step in it, in that category. Well, that's all right. I like that. And then taking something fun that you do in your personal life and turning it into a podcast. That's brilliant. I really enjoy that. And I like like I said, I like the podcast. It's one of the many wonderful podcasts we have at, at our at our podcast number. But I really enjoy yours because I like to learn things and I like to try to see if I get the answers. right. It's like watching Jeopardy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like you watch the show, you try to get them right. And, you know, that's home in t- in-house bragging that's rights. That's right. You know that's what I'm right. saying? If you get if you get more right than anybody else. Uh, my mom used to give us quarters if we'd get the answers right. Right. And I mean, I'm basically playing the Alex Trebek, right? My great producers help put together the questions with me. And, you know, I, I give some background context. You know, I sound like Alex Trebek. Some of these questions, I, I even I didn't know before I read them. So the the real goal, as I said before, is is really to to have fun, to educate not just my guests, but our listeners, and to just really, like, hammer in the fact that Black history is American history, and we should all know it, not just Black people, but like anyone who cares about, you know, Black folks, America, like it's a global conversation. And so all of our contributions that oftentimes aren't taught in school should be um, should be known and celebrated. That's dope. I like that. And as you alluded to, we're going to put you on the hot seat. We're going to put that thing down, flip it and reverse it, <laughs> and have you on the hot seat towards the end of this episode. We'll do our own little... A reverse black. Well, it's black as question still, but we'll just. I'll be. I get to be the host. That's right. For for that. I'm nervous, go but um, here we are. Hey, listen. I I love it because I was nervous. I'm sure everybody's every one one comment that that permeates every one of your episodes is people starting out with, "All right, I don't know. Right. I don't know how this is gonna go. I'm not sure if I'm ready." Something along those, some variation of that is what happens every single time. But you know, one of the reasons I wanted to do this conversation too is because, like I said earlier, I think everybody who's a part of these shows is such so interesting as hosts, and I wanted to be able to dig more into the things that make us interesting, the things that make you interesting. And one of those things is the is the fact that you were a professor, and I'm sure you can get the, the correct title, uh, associate professor, I believe, at Fordham University, right? Is that correct? That's right. <laughs> so that's exactly what I wanted to get into. Like, most of the academics I know are a little more, you know, stoic and chill, a little more rigid. But you out here throwing academic parties and all this other stuff because you and you are an academic. You are a, a, a you have a PhD. You're a professor. You're a political scientist. You be writing books. You be teaching all the classes. You see, I'm you be doing it. No, I'm, I'm throwing my B's in there. Uh, my A A V E. Uh, tell us a little bit about like the classes you teach and what it is you do. Like you have a book called Black Ethnics, like. You're such a fascinating person. And so please tell everybody about what it is that you do and who you are. Yeah. Well, you know, Pedro, I'm kind of basic in the sense that I just love black people in cities. If you know that about me, you kind of know everything about me. And so I wrote this book called Black Ethnics because I was really interested. I'm fascinated by how black people exist in this country that is America. That's like founded on like white supremacy and anti-black racism, and capitalism and patriarchy and how it is that we not only survive, but we thrive. Right. But we do so interacting with voluntary black immigrants from the Caribbean and Africa who came over in the last few decades and then also involuntary folks who are you know my ancestors who came uh, through U.S. chattel slavery and and essentially built a country. So how do we interact? And I'm fascinated by cities because that's where a lot of us live, but that's not where all of us live. And so what does it mean to have black leaders and black mayors? And we haven't had a lot of black governors, but I'm interested in you know what would it mean if we had Stacey Abrams as the first black female governor? We've never had a black female governor. You know, we've only had two black female senators. Like, what is it about race and gender and sort of being a black woman in this country that sort of creates a, a ceiling and not just a glass ceiling, but a very concrete, calcified ceiling, it seems. So as I try and detangle what it means to be a black person in this country, I thought this podcast would be a great way for me to, A, meet other interesting black people and talk to them about the things we love, but B, really highlight how we've contributed to this country that doesn't always love us back. And that's kind of the conversation that we've been having generation after generation about these loyal black people to a nation that is just very cold and uninviting and unkind in a lot of different facets of our lives. So I got to ask, so I'm also fascinated by cities. I have a master's degree in public policy. Um, yeah. I love you. You are going to guest lecture in my class, just so you know. Oh, you please. will be coming in. <laughs> Listen, I, I'm gonna say this, and it's gonna be it's gonna be this is my lowest academic point. I was uh, teaching a class on statistics once. I won't say where, and it was for college seniors, and they just weren't getting it. And I 
I haphazardly mentioned like cocaine like a brick. Like I was using hip hop lyrics or something. And all of a sudden, everybody's interest got peaked. So I ended up teaching an entire class using drug references and trying to explain the drug trade to a bunch of uh, <laughs> to a bunch of students in a stats class. Now, the thing is, it was the most it was the one part of the final everybody got right. Like once you start mm-hmm. teaching people about cocaine and everything and, the, and how crazy the 80s and 90s were, boy, they really get invested. But anyway, point is, I can I would be happy to come guest lecture your class. I just need to know the parameters ahead of time because next right. thing you know, yes. I'm starting to I'm starting to ask questions about paraphernalia and things, and you know. Right. But anyway, well, I, well, I, you know, when I teach, and I teach in a very conversational tone because people tend to remember conversations more than a lecture. Right. So if I'm explaining someone or something or some particular concept, it's a conversation just back and forth. Because when you're trying to recall this on the exam, you're going to remember some jokes. You're going to remember the banter. You're going to remember that, you know, I told Panama, hey, like, take your hat off, bruh, as I'm talking about the criminals that are the founding fathers. Right. And I also bring in guest lectures because there are people who are, are experts in particular facets of what I'm trying to explain. So if we want to talk about how the media portrays cities or black people in cities, I'm going to bring in a journalist because they're the ones who do this every single day. I had a friend who, you know, when I taught in politics years ago, who was a much more detailed, uh, he, he worked in finance. So it's like, I can tell you about bonds and city ratings and why it is that Detroit had a low rating compared to New York or DC. And that's, that's a lecture. Whereas I can bring in someone who has structured a bond deal with the mayor of Atlanta, right? And so that's a much more interesting conversation to have with students because then they have other questions about the real um, tactile process. And so for me, I'm from a long generation, I think I'm fourth or fifth generation educator. It's really important that, you know, A, people see me as a black woman in front of the classroom, but, you know, I, I love the fact that, you know, it's sort of like, you know, you see this being a parent, you throw out seeds every day and you just keep watering them and you have no idea what's going to flourish and when it's going to flourish. But when it does, sometimes I see it in three months. Sometimes I see it in three years. Sometimes I see it, you know, when a student emails me 10 years after like, hey, finally got that concept you were talking about. Just popped in my head. Now I get it. And it's like that to me is just one of the greatest feelings is, is being an educator. I think your listeners who are educators know exactly what I'm talking about. So I wonder, you, I imagine because you teach classes that have to do with blackness a lot, I mean, amongst other things, I, you have black students in your class, like probably the black students interested in poli sci are going to be taking your class, right? Do you, ha- do you see like a difference in what the talking heads are talking about or the issues in the black community versus what students in class who are coming in with ideas like they haven't been boxed in, so to speak, by mm-hmm. what TV or what everything is saying or the problems like? Is there just a different in perspective, a difference in perspective that you see versus, I guess, the mainstream media versus what students are thinking are the the prevailing issues of the day? Yeah, well, I mean, so much of my job, Panama, is teaching students to actually read the news. You know, I read several local papers every day. I, I consume news for a good hour and change before I even put my feet on the ground. So, you know, I always tell my students, and I teach intro to politics every semester because I think it should be taught by people who are sort of experts in the field. And, you know, my stature in the department, I'm in the associate chair. So it's like, why is she teaching intro? That's usually something that, you know, we sort of farm off, a lot of universities farm off to someone else. It's like, no, no, no. To me, the intro classes are the most important classes, not the least important classes. Not the senior seminars. I think, you know, the intro class is like, that's where you get your foundation. So I always tell my students, it's like reading the news should be done like brushing your teeth at least twice a day, right? In the morning and the evening. And then if you're really on it, like throughout the day. But I have a lot, most of my students, Black and other, um, don't come to my classes having, you know, a, a strong sense of like needing to read the news. And so I recognize that most of the concepts that I teach them they'll forget, you know, in the next few years. And that's fine. You know, I'm laying a foundation and it's a feeling that I want to leave them with. So it's like, I want to leave them with the feeling of if they haven't read the news in the morning, they should feel like I'm missing something. Like what's going on in the world? Not just in America, but like what, like do, you know, obviously during the the reign of President 45, you know, it's like, are we going to be at war in the morning? Like you need to wake up and read the news. You don't know what beef he started while you were sleeping. Like, 
Are we fighting with someone in the middle of the Baltic Sea? I don't know. So this is, you know, we're a slightly more calm period, but, you know, we should know if our neighbors in Mississippi have no water. We should know, um, you know, if the mayor of New York City, like, what is he doing now that the federal government said you can carry guns in major cities? Like, we live in New York, so we should know how that's going to play out. And so trying to get them linked and connected to what they see in the news is directly uh, linked to them. And they should care about what's going on, not just in their city, not just in their home city, but like across the U.S. and more broadly in a global sense. I have a somewhat theoretical question about like the political sphere and, 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 and molding the minds of young people. I feel like in order to fully engage with politics, there has to be a certain level of optimism that you have to maintain. You have to believe that there is some there is some essential core that people all hold true that they're shooting for. It's just we might have different ways of getting there. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of people, cynicism is also like the po politics. Mm -hmm. I, I worked on Capitol Hill for years, made me completely mm -hmm. cynical. Not only that, I worked with the money. So I, w I worked with the budgets. I worked with the dough. So I'm completely cynical about the whole process. But how do you maintain that optimism and provide mm -hmm. that optimism to the young people who are stepping off into this world? Because if you're going to major in, in, uh, in, in poli sci, politics of any sort, you got to believe in the system to some mm -hmm. degree. You got to believe that there's a system that genuinely wants to work and can, if not for the people who are involved in it. So how do you keep that energy and keep that optimism? Absolutely. I mean, I'm a pragmatic optimist. So, you know, I know who this country is and I know her limitations and I know that she has evolved and retracted and evolved some more and retracted some more. I think part of my optimism is I have the privilege of being with the youth of America. So, so much of, you know, the hate mail that I get from my forward facing work when I, you know, talk on news programs is, you know, these sort of right wing racist people who were just incensed that I actually do get to mold the minds of the future generation. You know, I actually do get to sort of help them see, uh, themselves as a part of future conversations. So most of my exam questions actually don't have like a right or wrong answer. It's actually, you have to analyze something. And so if you can make your case, then we can go from there. So for example, like if I'm teaching intro to politics, you know, final exam question has been, you know, what branch of government do you think is the strongest? Courts, presidency, or, uh, or legislative branch, right? And if you make the case that it's the courts and you say, well, because of the Dobbs decision, you know, and, and a woman's right to choose, the courts are the most powerful branch. And you write 12 pages as to what that argument is. And someone else is like, no, 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 it's Congress. Look at the laws that they made. And they overrode a veto. And you make that argument. That is also correct. But if you say, no, the president, he just did, you know, 16 executive orders and he's got power for the next, you know, three years. So those are questions where it's like, I'm putting you directly in the center of things. And I'm also reminding you where it's like, well, at some point, Panama, you may be a Senator who's called on to, to think about, do we expand the court? So in the past, the question has been hypothetical question, but now it's a real question. You know, if we expand the size of the Supreme Court, what number should it be? Some people say 13, some people say 21. Well, so, well, we've talked all semester about collective action problems. You know, those of you who are from big families, you know, it's like if Chrissy and Panama are trying to decide where to go to dinner, you say pizza, I say sushi, <laughs> we can flip a coin, right? But if it's right. you, me, Michael, Mark, you know, and like the rest of the Grio family, then all of a sudden we've got a collective action problem. So I try and help them see, you know, cause I always have some students who are like, yeah, I, my mom has nine brothers. You know, my dad has 12 sisters. So it's like, right. If all your cousins have to make a decision versus you and your two sisters, that's a very different conversation. So imagine if you're the Supreme court or imagine if you're the house versus the Senate 435 versus hundred. So having them see themselves as future individuals who will be charged with thinking through these issues, either as an elected official or someone who works in government in some capacity. I like that. I like the the imaginative. Like you have to see yourself in the system. Yes. To mm -hmm. impact the system, you have to see how you are a player or a part of it. I like that. Good job. <laughs> well, I'm trying, man. I'm trying, and especially for um, you know my female students. Most of them are from states where they've never had a female senator or female governor, and so there are a lot of my students were, you know, I get asked to moderate panels and obviously I, I can't get paid for, for this type of work, but I get paid in, you can give me five tickets for my students to attend. 
So I try and, you know, give everyone an opportunity, but it's definitely, if the, if the Senator from Washington state is going to be there, I'm going to invite a student from my class who's from Washington state, right? If the Senator from, you know, or the governor from Michigan is going to be there, I'm going to invite my student from Michigan. Because once you meet one elected official, you are exponentially more likely to A, vote, and B, participate in a much more active way in, in politics. And so that's, politics is an imperfect game. I understand a lot of people are corrupt and they're already jaded even at a young age, but it's like, it will not change if we just write it off and say that we're disinterested. We have to be in it. Gotcha. I'm, I'm with you. I love that. I love the representation piece of it. I love all that. Before we go to a break, tell us about your book, Black Ethnics. I love the title, but I, but I, I, what does that mean? What are we talking about? <laughs> right. So I started with a vignette. When I went to college at Tufts, um, there were a lot of students who were Caribbean descent, a lot of students of African right. descent. There was a small number of us who were Black Americans or the JBs, right? Where it's like, oh, where are you from? It's like, um, you know. Chicago was like, no, where are you from from? It's like, I don't know, I'm just black. So it's like, you had the JVs. <laughs> and then you had the, you had the, you know, you had the just blacks, and then folks who were like Ghana, Nigeria, Trinidad, Jamaica, Haiti, you know, the whole the whole spectrum. And so I was really interested in not the divisive conversation, but what are the policy points where they specific policy issues where we could actually come together and build coalitions and actually get more as a group as opposed to being sort of three separate entities. And so when is it that race is the primary factor as like us as black folks? And when is it that ethnicity actually really matters where someone is like, no, 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 I'm Ghanaian and you're black American and we are not on the same page. And so moving forward, it's all, for me, it's all about coalition building for black people and like knowing where that is so we can actually get more as a team. So my wife is from Ghana. And when I tell you, <laughs> I probably need to get your book because coalition building is probably yes. one of the most <laughs> significant. That let me. I I love the fact that my wife is from a different country. Like we're both black people, but the fact we both went to HBCU. She went to Howard. Went to Morehouse. But boy, when I tell you those cultural differences rear their They're head, real. The most interesting. I've had the most fascinating conversations, arguments, debates with her family, with my family, just like about the differences. And it's and I'm from down south, so you know we don't get it's it's typically tends to be black people, white people and Latinos of some sort. Right. You know, we, but when I started the Northeast, you get everybody genuinely claiming their, their cultural identity creates all these different mm -hmm. conversations. So, and sometimes some tensions just, yeah. too. And we, was it was a hard book exactly. to write <laughs> because these were in, these are internal conversations we've been having. And this is a hard book because I can't say, hey, non-Black people, you can't read it. So it's like there is an element of laundry that we have. And it has to do with, you know, voluntary versus involuntary. There's some obviously some different class elements, but time matters as well. And so, you know, yes, we are all Black and they're Black with a prefix too. They don't just get to be Americans. They have to be Black Americans, unlike other immigrants. And so what does that then mean when we're still trying to exist in the shadow of white supremacy and anti-black racism. I love it. I'm, I'm about to get a copy of that book. I can't I'll wait. I'll send you I'll a copy, you. personal That's signed okay. copy for you and the white. <laughs> Cause let me tell you, I, I we have uh, as uh, parents to children mm -hmm. and boys who are growing up here in America, like just the, yeah, we have a lot of, uh, they are and amicably of course, but there's just a lot of learning mm -hmm. that everybody has to do on both sides mm -hmm. about, what it means to be who you are and where you're from mm -hmm. and how that impacts the way you view everything. And uh, yeah, I love this. So look, that's awesome. I can't, I can't wait to dig in. I'm definitely going to get, listen, you send me a signed copy. I'm reading that bad boy. It's going to, it's going to be sitting on my, my coffee table downstairs. <laughs> it will a, be done this welcome week. to my home. Let's <laughs> argue. Um, <laughs> we're going to take a real quick break right here. And when we come back, we're going to flip the tables on Chrissy. And we're going to give her some blackest questions trivia and see if she can and see if she can guess now based on things that you know and love so uh we'll be right back here on dear culture stay tuned the griot black podcast network is here everything you've been waiting for black culture amplified find your voice on the black podcast network listen today on the griot mobile app and tune in everywhere great podcasts are heard We're back here in Dear Culture. Our guest is still 
Dr. Christina Greer, Chrissy, the homie, the host of the Blackest Questions podcast here on the Greer Black Podcast Network. And typically she's, if you listen to her podcast, she's asking people all kinds of questions they can't answer. They have no idea. Um, people get things right, but people are always going to get at least one thing wrong. Has mm-hmm. anybody got all the answers right yet? Uh, I think Michael Twitty, who is an amazing chef, uh, and an author of a new cooking book called The Cooking Gene and Kosher Soul is his newest book. I think he got all of them right. Who is the only black person to be featured in the Celebrity Chef postage stamp series in 2014. Edna Lewis. Oh my goodness, you're hot today. But most people don't, and that's okay, right? Because we're we're all learning together. We're all an intellectual journey together. I say that because now I'm scared. I, yeah, I tell my kids that nonsense too. Like, no, I get the answers <laughs> right, homie. Like, listen, I, I feel you, but listen, nobody who sits down for a test is like, you know what? I'm just gonna shoot to get a couple right. You want to get them all right, and your I feelings do. are hurt when you don't. I do. So, right. You don't want to tell your teacher. I was just on an intellectual journey here. <laughs> right. No, nope, nobody cares. Nobody. I mean, we care, but everybody's like, yeah. But did you get the answer? Like, what did you get wrong, and why? So, you are a music, a music person. Right, yeah. that's your big, your big music fan. You have a very interesting hip hop specific like era that you're a fan of. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna talk about that after I ask this first question. We're gonna see if you get it right. Okay, and I only have three questions for you, but this should okay. be fun. All right. So you told me before that uh, Biggie, the notorious Big, is your favorite rapper. Christopher right? Wallace, yes. Yeah. Christopher Wallace. Our first introduction for most people was Juicy, right? Juicy is the song that most people mm-hmm. probably came to know him. I'm familiar from the uh, Who's the Man soundtrack uh-huh. with the song Party and BS. Uh-huh. So I didn't even realize that was the same person by the time it came around. Anyway, what was his first charting number one pop hit? Mm. He has two. He has two. But what was the first one? Um... Hmm, that's a good one. I don't know. Um, because it's not party and BS. It's it is not. It's not juicy. Um, it's also not. Uh, brrr, ooh, I don't know. I'm thinking of like Junior Mafia, but that's not. That's not good money. Um, I don't know. Tell me. Hypnotize. Oh, of course. Hypnotize See, is, is his this first. This is how I guess feel. Of course it yes, is. Yes, it is. <laughs> Plus, wanna do a screw us, screw us, yeah, Papa and Mo. <laughs> right. Of course now, it is. Juicy, he has like five, he has like five like rap number ones. Okay. But he has two pop number ones, which would be Mo Money, Mo Problems okay. and Hypnotize, which was his first one, oh. possibly spurred also by his passing. You know, the single right. comes out and then, but, but uh, uh, yeah. Huh. Okay. Mo Money, More Problems, I think, so. was like humming around in my head, but hypnotized. All right, that makes sense. Oh, Biggie. Oh, Absolutely. Biggie. Huge video, yeah. million plus dollar budget, insane, pure insanity. Now, you have this interesting era, like a small frame of, 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 of hip hop that you listen to. Please tell please tell the people about this, uh, yeah. this this small era of what you listen to and why. I'm stuck in 1993 to 1998, and I'm totally happy with it. Like... I have no idea who all the Lils are, like Lil Baby, Da Baby, all these people. My niece is always trying to explain. I'm like, (laughs) what? These names are ridiculous. Or young this person, young that person. I'm like, no. It is just, it's like, it's Biggie, it's Tribe, it's Outkast, it's Wu-Tang. Like, that is all I need. If if someone was like, you have to go on a desert island and just take like a few CDs, it's like, I'm taking Missy's first album. I'm taking Busta Rhymes' When Disaster Strikes. I'm taking Biggie's first album. I'm taking Tribe's Midnight Marauders. I'm taking Outkast, ATLians, probably. Um, I'm taking, obviously, Wu-Tang's first album. I'm taking Old Dirty Bastard, who's my favorite of the Wu-Tang clan. Like, his solo album, I think, is a piece of art. Like, literally, I think it is, it is a masterpiece in, like... Uh, uh, it, it feels like um, it feels like like performance art, like it should be in the Guggenheim or something like that. You didn't even touch my skill. You gotta go to one kill be, and he ain't for the kill now. Chop that down. That's all around. So you know, obviously Queen Latifah's Black Rain. Like I'm, I'm just stuck, and I'm happy with that. And that's not to say that you know, like the Fuji's first album. Like other albums have come out after 1998. They're fine. 
but I don't need them really. I just need whatever came out. You know, like Dr. Dre, Snoop. I mean, like Snoop's first album. I just, it's like, that's all I need. And you think about it and it's like, listen, their subsequent albums have been great, sure. But like when you think of Snoop's first album, when you think of Dre's first album, when you think of Biggie's first album, you really don't need much else. The only place where I deviate is Outkast's first album doesn't really do that much for me. It's their second album that does stuff. Tribe's first album doesn't really do that much for me. It's their second and third albums that really do it for me. So I'm very specific. It gets a little more complicated with R&B and, and other artists, but like for hip hop, I'm stuck and I'm fine. And I have my Mount Rushmore's and I'm good. Fair enough. So you're a life after you're a ready to die versus life after death person because you mentioned life after death, but you didn't say anything about. I mean, you mentioned ready to die, but you didn't mention life, anything about life, life after, after death. Life after death is good. I just I'm curious as to what it would have been like if Biggie were fully alive. You know, some of those cuts and remixes were made after he passed or he was murdered. Um, but I think that. Ready to Die is a perfect conceptual album where I can listen to it start to finish. The skits all work. Okay. Um, everything is seamless. I think Life After Death, to me, there's certain songs where I'm like, mm, I can skip this one, right? So um, it's sort of like... It's a double album. That happens. Yeah, it happens yeah. with a double album. You know, like think of like The Love Below. It's like, eh, well, you know, I don't need to hear oh, whoa, all of them. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> perfect album. I don't know. Perfect. Like Big Boys, I skip some of his songs. Oh, sorry. Yeah, 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 but you, the, but that speaker box. That speaker box. That love below. Yeah. Love below. So Dre's album. I call. Yes. See, this is this lets me. You know my bias, right? I call love below speaker box. Just love below, because I, I basically I'm like, eh, we can skip over most of the speaker box. Even though I have great respect for Big Boy, he's not on my Mount Rushmore, but I have great respect for him. Midnight Marauders. Right. I can also listen to start to finish. Just yeah, you know, I so think... like Purple Rain. Like there's, I don't need to skip anything. Yeah, I think that's the one album that if um, every time I've lost it, I went to go buy it. Like if I had to take one album with me, like period, that's the album I probably would take. And it overtook De La Soul is Dead, which for, I don't know, for 20 years was like my literal favorite hip hop, favorite album bar none, like genre, regardless of genre. Uh, but because of streaming, it was never my go to when streaming hit was never my go to was always Midnight Marauders. And I think it just kind of naturally yeah. took over. But uh, I have Midnight Marauders on wax. Like I have Midnight Marauders on wax. I have Ready to Die on wax. I have Wu Tang on wax. I have um, Old Dirty Bastard on wax. Like so, there are certain albums that I had the tape, I had the CD, and now I have the vinyl because it's like I, I need it. I need to ex access it no matter where I am and when I am. Okay, so hip hop a little bit limited there, <laughs> but limited in the most expansive way possible. Yes. How are you going yes. that? R&B, soul, different story. So you also told me that Luther Vandross, one of your yeah. favorite artists. So here's a here's a question related to Luther. Okay. What song did Luther Vandross write for Dionne Warwick, but because it wasn't released as a single for her, he re-recorded it and released it himself later and became one of the most staple Luther Vandross songs of all time? Is it House Is Not Home? It is not. Hmm. Any love? It is not that either. I don't know. I know he sang back up for Roberta Flack before she let him go. I know he started the Patti LaBelle fan club. Um, I don't know. I mean, Dionne Warwick, I have a lot of her records because I have all of my dad's record collection from college. She's a beast, low key. Like, we sleep on Dionne Warwick a lot. Um, I don't know. Tell me. That would be the song So Amazing. Ooh. That. That yep. could be a so really amazing, great yes. Dionne Warwick song. You know, I gladly go anywhere you take me. It's so amazing to be loved. I'd follow you to the moon and the sky above. Because, you know, she has all the, those. Oh, it's amazing. Baccarat sort of covers. And I just. Yes. Her voice to me is like. She's a female Lou Rawls to me. Lou Rawls is one of my favorites. I can see that. His, or hear that, his voice is like chocolate milk to me. And hers is like a version of that. It's like smoky and like thick. It's almost like you're pouring like glue out or something like that. Like I love her voice. Um, but I also love Sissy Houston's voice. I mean, like the two of them, you know, when you sort of think about Sissy Houston singing back up for Aretha and like Dion having her own career with all these Burt Backrack hits. I'm just like, I listen to my dad's albums on wax and they're in pretty solid condition 
So people are like, what kind of time capsule are we in when we come to the Greer household? Because <laughs> I just, That's I like to, I you that. know why? Playing records slows down a conversation. And for people like us who like conversations and we have 13 conversations on the table at once, playing an album makes us take a beat, pun intended, and I have to go and flip the album or I have to go and get a new album. And it sort of resets the conversation in a nice kind of natural way. And then we reshift as opposed to say Spotify, where it's just like every four minutes we change. Right. Vinyl and vinyl, it does something to people. Like when people see that, if they're interested mm -hmm. in vinyl too, like there's a, a whole conversation that people have. They see you have, see you have albums like, oh, why do you have this? Or, or look, they have to look through your collection and see what yeah. they have, you know, depending on. But you remember. It's, it does. I, and, and having a record player does that. It makes you look, it makes you look sophisticated, <laughs> number one. And it's a conversation piece all by yeah. itself. Well, when, and the fact that I bought new records, but the vast majority of my collection, I would say like 90% of my collection is my dad's record collection. So I feel like I've gotten to know my dad through his record collection. I mean, you know, I was raised with my dad, you know, we're chatty, but to know his records and what he was into in his 20s, and he gave me his record collection when I was in my late teens, early 20s, I was like, this is what he was listening to in college. So I listened to his records in college with my friends. And it's just, it's a, it was a very different way to like get to know my dad. But also when people stay at my house, I pull out records that I think they would be interested in. And so sometimes they're like, I had no idea this existed, but it's like, yeah, I thought of you. And I thought that this, this obscure Isley Brothers record would be something. And it's also great because you see how much people have sampled. You know, obviously Dr. Dre is deep in the crates. So you have some you know, one-off artist that my dad has the record for, but it's like, Dr. Dre sampled this or like Puffy sampled this. It's like, you had no idea that, you know, they were even listening to, you know, Stevie Wonder's random girlfriend from like that one year that he made a record for. Right. Okay. Well, so amazing. You should check out Dion's version if you haven't. It is, it is so amazing. Uh, very similar, but you know, they, they just got different voices and, and, and Luther just takes it to a whole different, but it sounds the same. It's just the you know vocally the 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 different voices, the texture is just completely different. But both both awesome. But obviously Luther's is the more popular one uh, at this point. Hell, half the people I talked to don't even realize Dion. That was like Dion song first. It was really Clive Davis didn't want that to be a single. So when it became a single that I think it even won awards like a Soul Train award and became like a hit single for Luther. Dion went back to Clive, like, so you ain't wrong. You ain't right all the time. <laughs> well, I have, so. a, I have an old school record of early 80s of, that Luther produced for Aretha Franklin. So she's kind of on like, you know, it was like changing of the time, change of the guard, change of her label. And Luther wrote and produced this album for her and he sings backup. And it basically feels like a Luther Jr. album. Um, and it's, it's, his imprint is very strong, I will say, in, in sort of 80s and 90s music in my household especially okay i'm over two i love it go ahead <laughs> i need this i need this ego um <laughs> grounding well this is the last okay. question so this, this is gonna be the last question but you've mentioned aretha already so you kind of segued mm -hmm. in in for us this one might be a trick question so i'm just gonna let you know that ahead of time how long was aretha franklin's funeral oh goodness lord i was at a conference and i had like had to go present a paper came back and we had a new casket. Um, how long was her funeral? I'm going to say, was it like seven hours or something? Or was it a few days? We'll see. So, you know what? You got the answer right. It don't even matter. The fact that you just do a few <laughs> days, seven <laughs> hours, know. there ain't no right answer to this question. That's why it's a trick question. There ain't no right answer. If you said it's still going on right, right now, the answer is still correct. I believe it clocked into over eight hours. So it's funny. I actually... um. I don't know if you remember when she passed, they put out this, they 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 put out like a, a list of everybody that was going to be performing and they had everybody with a time slot. So I was at the root at the time and I wrote this article. I was like the Aretha Franklin, whatever is the most optimistic funeral schedule I've ever seen <laughs> in my life. And anyone who's ever been to a because, black funeral like, knows. Right. You remember people was eating snacks because, you know, people on there, they, you give four minutes to Tasha Cop. Like, are you right. crazy? Like, you think Yolanda Adams can do right. one run in right. a minute? Like, she needs like 15 minutes. 
the funeral lasted forever. There were outfit changes and the whole nine. Either way, so that's why it was a trick question because there's no right answer to this right. one. Whatever you say is the well, right answer. Well, I went to Luther Vandross' funeral. So look, you got that. Because um, it was, you know, down the, you. down the street from me when I was in grad school at um, um, <laughs> Riverside Church. And I don't know who put that together. First, it was like Stevie Wonder performed and, and Aretha and Roberta Flack. And, you know, everyone was there. But someone had the audacity to put Patti LaBelle as like a reader of a poem, but not on as a singer. So, you know, Dionne Warwick's there, Sissy Houston's there. And these are people who are performing, but they expect Patti to just go read a passage and not sing. So of course she gets up in her canary yellow dress and everyone's like, Patty! And she's like, right, I'm gonna sit here and sing a song that is not on the program. And of course, you know, you got a whole bunch of divas in the first row. It then turned into a full concert, which as we're all grieving the late great Luther Vandross, but I was like, who thought that Patty LaBelle would just go up there and read a two minute passage when all of her friends slash arch nemeses are singing? Like, I don't think so. So yeah, it was a beautiful funeral. Um, you know, as, as black funerals always are, you know, a little bit of drama and lots of, lots of levity. That's just how we do it. That is how we do it. Well, Look, you you missed the first two, but you got yes. the last one right. So uh, that's how I think the most of us feel on the blackest questions. Uh, everyone that I've listened to, everybody goes in real nervous. Yeah. They're like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready. I don't know. But, you know, we all learn something. We all gain information and knowledge, and it's all, it's, it's all fun. Absolutely. So we're going to take a one last break here at Dear Culture, come back with two of my favorite segments here to close out the episode where we're going to find out a little bit more about Dr. Christina Greer uh, and her blackness here on Dear Culture. Stay tuned. All right, we're back here on Dear Culture with Dr. Christina Greer, Chrissy, the homie. We've just had a, a fun little back and forth uh, using her blackest format, a uh, blackest questions format where we ask some questions. Uh, two of them she didn't get right, and that's how I felt. That's how we all feel. That's how we all feel. We get hit with those questions like, say what? Who would, who would know that? Oh, you know that. Okay, that's all right. But I appreciate that. I appreciate the give and take. That's what it's all about. That's what that's blackness right. is all about, the give and that's take. Right. Well, to end our show, Dear Culture, to end our every episode, we do this thing where we have, we ask our guests for a black fashion, a black fashion being a confession about your blackness, basically something people might not expect because you're a black person. Yes. Um, the answers always run the gamut. So I'm very, I'm always interested to see what people come to the table with. Do you have a black fashion? Um, I first made it to our friend Roy Wood Jr., who's a friend of the Brio. Um, and then when I had Michael Twitty on my Blackest Questions podcast, who's a chef and a cookbook author, um, I confessed. And I'm going to tell you and your listeners that I am a Black person. I am a descendant of the U.S. South. Uh, both, of my, both sets of my grandparents are Southerners. And I can only eat my grits with ketchup and mustard until they are bright fluorescent orange. And that is the only way I can eat grits. I don't do butter. I don't do sugar. I don't do salt and pepper. I don't do cheese. It has to be ketchup and yellow mustard. That is my black fashion. I know you can take away my black card if you want to. I don't care. I'm standing true. Yes. But everyone says they hate it, but no one has tried it. So don't knock it before you try it. With some fried fish on top. How did you dis <laughs> how did you discover this? I was like what were what what <laughs> happened that day where you were like, you know what? Like what weren't you doing where you decided to put ketchup and right. mustard? Awesome. I think I was like oh, four goodness. and I think I had a babysitter where we had grits and I wasn't eating them because I didn't like the texture. You know, a lot of folks are very sensitive about texture. Like I don't like the texture of eggplant, but I love the texture of okra. Um, and I think she was trying to get me to eat my grits. And because I like ketchup and mustard, my hot dog, when I was a kid, when I ate hot dogs until I realized what's in a hot dog. Um, I think she just sort of was like, Hey, let's try this. And I loved it. And I love fried fish and grits. And so I like fried fish with hot sauce and lime juice over my ketchup and mustard grits. That is my black fashion. Your face looks horrified. You look mortified. Have people seen you do this? Like, have so people here's watched you do this? I only eat like grits around my family and I don't eat grits in public because it usually causes a kerfuffle. 
So if they're grits, like if we're at brunch. Yeah, I mean, talk about a conversation. If we're at brunch starter. or like, you know, or I'm at your house and, you know, you guys have grits on the table, I won't eat grits. If we're out at a restaurant, I won't eat grits. But if I'm with my family in the safe space of people who know that I do this and they just, they look and, you know, the spirit of my grandmother just shakes her head. Um, that's that. But it's sort of, it's like, you know, one of those things where it's like, you know, how some people are like, you know, closet smokers or like closet drinkers. I'm like a closet grits eater where I can only, I can only do it around certain people. You know, I got to say, I don't know how many episodes we've done of this show of Dear Culture. You, you are easily the number one black fashion. Yeah. Like there's nothing topping that. Cause number one, I didn't see it coming. Number two, I mean, people argue about mm -hmm. sugar and salt and but and grits, and you over here and ketchup and mustard, and you needed. To I need change. it to be oh, bright orange, I'm and I go by color. That's when I know it's ready. Yes, I know. I my face says it all, and I I yeah. just wow, I just, I just became a meme. <laughs> Because but you face. know the thing okay. is, I kept this as a secret for so wow. many years, and now I'm just standing in my truth. That's right. Listen, you should, you should. I, I'm with you. I mean, I'm not with you, but I I respect it while also being slightly horrified. I, there's no, there's literally no universe where I would try that. Like it, it's, it's impossible. Oh my goodness! All right, like I get. I, <laughs> that's fine. Congratulations to you. I'm very happy for you. And, and I hope that that it brings you as much joy as it brings me, whatever the extreme other end of joy is. Okay. Well, tip after we give a black fashion, which again, number one, you I, are I'm stumped Panama. the number one <laughs> black fashion. I don't even know. You did. You did. So we also like to ask our guests for a black recommendation, which is a recommendation about something for buying a black about black people. Uh, I'm going to ask that you don't include grits with ketchup and mustard as a black recommendation. Uh, but I am curious to see what you might be bringing to the table. Do you have a black recommendation as well? I do. So, I mean, obviously, you know, I would love for your listeners to tune in to the blackest questions and, and play along with us. We've had some great guests and um, we have a new episode, you know, with a, a Haitian chef, coincidentally. Um, uh, she's just also just, you know, showcasing just the beauty of black people, just really kind, smart black people. Um, but, you know, I um, support Polly Irungu, who is um, she's a, a woman who started black women photographers. Uh, and, you know, they're on Instagram and they're on Twitter. And every few months they do like a, a sale to um, support black female photographers and they, you know, um, they have a print sale. So they'll sell various prints of the women who are part of this collective. So they're from all over the continent of Africa, all over the Caribbean and black women from all across the U.S. and in certain parts of Europe as well, you know, because we're a diasporic people. Um, but I've gotten some beautiful prints in my home, but they really, she's, she started this from like a small idea but it's a really great way to kind of see the world through black women's eyes. And so, you know, the pictures range from landscapes to people having fun to protests from, you know, a few summers ago um, to all different types of photography. So if you're into photography, you can buy prints when they have sales and it helps other black women, you know, get a camera or get a, a photo lesson. And it's a collective, and, you know, I love coalition building. So, uh, this this collective of Black women, they share resources, they share jobs, and so I like to help them out and support whenever I can. That sounds dope. Okay, that was that. Yeah, that, brought you back. All right. <laughs> that I, redeemed I'm, me from I'm, my I'm grit. There, I'm, I'm there with you on that one. <laughs> well, it brought you back. So I'm just. In the, it's going to take me a little while. Okay, I'm going to have to process that one on the other end of that, but. Tell people where can they find what you got going on? You know, where can they, everybody wants the social media, where can people find you and listen to your podcast? So uh, on Twitter and Instagram, I'm at dr underscore C M Greer, G-R-E-E-R. -E um, I write a weekly column for the Amsterdam News, which is one of the oldest black newspapers in the country. Uh, obviously, I have the Blackest Questions podcast. So you can find me uh, on the Griot Black Podcast Network. And then I sort of, if you live in New York, I'm a political contributor for New York One. And if you watch national news, I 
sometimes dibble and dabble on MSNBC and talk about national politics. And on New York One, I talk about New York City politics. Well, all right. That's awesome. I, I love it. I love black people who are doing amazing things. And you are definitely one of those folks. Um, so thank you for being a part of, of the Dear Culture podcast. I'm a fan of yours. I listen to the episodes. Uh, I learn a lot. I love learning. So that's one of the things that I gained from 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 your podcast. And everybody should check it out. The Blackest Questions. What day does it? It comes out. Every, uh, what day? We drop every Tuesday. And I just want to thank you so much for having me on. I've been a fan of yours since back in the day, the old school VSB days. <laughs> uh, you and Damon have just been so, so wonderful and so smart and, and been leaders in the culture. So thank you so much for having me on, Dear Culture. Well, I appreciate that. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, if you like what you heard, make sure you download the Griot app and check out all the podcasts that we have. Obviously, the Blackest Questions. Please check out other episodes of Dear Culture, Griot Daily, Writing Black on My Chicago. We have a bunch of podcasts in the pipeline that are about to drop. Like, so much blackness, so much black excellence. It's it's really worth your time, energy, and effort. Um, please email all questions, suggestions, scams, uh, cash apps that you want to send me for my time and services, whatever you got. Please send us a podcast at thegrill.com. Um, though if you send money there, I'm sure the company's going to take this. You might want to put my name on it, like put my name in the memo and say, please send us to Panama. Um, Dear Culture is an original podcast of the Real Black Podcast Network. It is produced by Sasha Armstrong and edited by Cameron Blackwell. Taji Sr. is our logistic associate producer. And Regina Griffin is our managing editor of podcasts. I'm your host, Panama Jackson. Thank you for listening. Thank you for checking out Dear Culture. Have a black one. Don't forget, you can listen to the Griot's Writing Black podcast hosted by me, Maisha Kai. This isn't your typical writing podcast. We interview any and everybody that has anything to do with writing, from comics to poets to authors to journalists to politicians and more. Remember, that's Writing Black every Sunday right here on the Griot's Black Podcast Network. Download the Griot's app to listen to Writing Black wherever you are.